we have a lot of young women these days with a lot of artificially lowered voices because Ugh. they can't get their voices back once they've been on testosterone. A lot of women have had double mastectomies and will never have their natural breasts back. Um, and people sort of brush that off and say, well, they can just get synthetic ones. And it's like, how are we here? How on earth are we here? Um, and it's, there are plenty of boys and young men who are going through this as well. It's just much more prevalent in young women because it's young women who are being pressured into this more than boys. And that's not to say I lack sympathy for the boys who are going through this. Of course, I have tremendous sympathy for boys. You know, how, how graphic do you, can, can we be here? No, be graphic. People should know what's going on. Like this is awful. Welcome to episode 152 of my podcast. I'm Michaela Peterson. I had Kara Dansky on. Kara is a lawyer, public speaker, and writer, and a self-described feminist fighting for the sex-based rights of women and girls, publicly speaking out about the gender identity industry. Don't run away yet. I never associated myself with feminism. I didn't really see a need for it. I actually argued against kind of the woke feminism that was starting to present itself in my high school and definitely in my university. However, we have gone so far backwards in regards to women's rights that we spoke about feminism, legal precedents that affect women in America, trans athletes, the Biden administration, the Dana Rivers case, and more. I hope you enjoy this episode. It's one that everyone with a kid or anyone thinking of having kids or anyone who has family in high schools or elementary schools should watch. Or if you want to know more about what's actually happening to mostly little girls because of woke politics, it's gruesome and it needs to be spoken about. This trans discussion and debate isn't about inclusion anymore. We had inclusion already. Toronto did anyway, where I grew up. What I'm concerned about is having kids brainwashed and confused in elementary school to the point where they want to be put on hormones and drugs and do surgery under the age of 18 that causes irreversible damage, all done under the context of being nice and inclusive. What's going on in the public schools and in America regarding gender reassignment isn't nice. It's destroying people's lives. So we talk about that. Before we get into that, this episode was brought to you by NordVPN. Have you guys been watching The Boys, the TV show? If not, and you don't mind serious blood and gore, the actors do an amazing job. I used to get all my good TV shows in Canada through NordVPN. Now I'm in land of the free-ish, that could go either way, and I mostly use NordVPN to protect myself online. NordVPN has state-of-the-art encryption that keeps you safe from hackers, malware, and other sneaky threats lurking all over the internet. NordVPN never buffers or crashes with over 5,300 servers around the world, which translates into connection speeds of up to 6,730 megabits per second. That's insane. Take advantage of their exclusive limited time offer today and see what full online protection really feels like. Grab your NordVPN deal today over at nordvpn.com slash TMPP or use code TMPP for 61% off their premium plan and their free anti-malware feature, all with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. Enjoy this episode. Kara Dansky, welcome to my podcast. Thanks for having me. So I spotted you on Twitter. I think somebody tagged me in a tweet you had sent out and said, we should chat. And so I went ahead and did some research on you and read your book um, and invited you on and canceled a whole bunch of times. But now here we are. So I'm really glad you can be here. Before we get started, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Sure. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm a lawyer. I got my law degree and I spent about 20 years working in what I would refer to as the progressive criminal justice reform movement in the U S uh, that came to a halt, uh, toward the late, uh, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, I started getting involved in women's liberation front. And now I'm the president of the U S chapter of Women's Declaration International. In the meantime, I wrote a book called The Abolition of Sex, How the Transgender Agenda Harms Women and Girls. And now because of the work that I've been doing on you know, radical, radical feminist 
uh, critiques of so-called gender identity. It is no longer possible for me to get work in the criminal justice reform community, uh, which is fine. I'm very happy to be doing what I'm doing. Okay. That's a lot to take in. So you said it's no longer possible for you to get work. Why, why is that? So between 2015 and 2018, I was doing independent consulting work on a broad range of topics, including drug policy reform, immigration policy, uh, mass incarceration, police militarization, wow. and things like that. And I was doing this project that was a really interesting project involving immigration advocacy and federal public defenders at the U.S.-Mexico border. And the person that I had my contract with informed me that because I'm a known turf, I'm toxic to the project. And so she had to cancel my contract. She did so uh, reluctantly. <laughs> she really liked working with me and she wanted to keep me on. But other people involved told her that I was toxic to the project and that I had to go. And I understood exactly why that was because of how all of this is playing out throughout our society. And then later I got a job in 2018 at a DC city agency. And in early 2019, I appeared on a panel at the heritage foundation called the inequality of the equality act concerns from the left. And that made a lot of people really angry and they complained to my boss. And over the course of 20. 18, 2019, it just became untenable. It became impossible for me to speak out about this topic during non-work hours. I never allowed my work with Women's Liberation Front or Women's Declaration International to interfere with my job. But nonetheless, people were so angry at things that I was saying during my non-work hours on sex and gender that they mm. basically just kept harassing my boss. And she kept having to spend a lot of time dealing with it. And I had to spend a lot of time dealing with it. And eventually I just quit my job. And that was the end of 2019. And so I've just been talking a lot about sex and gender ever since. Okay. Can you describe what a TERF is? So the acronym TERF stands for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. Oh, yes. Okay. I have heard that. Yes. So uh, these are women who th the term was invented by people who were very angry that women were standing up for ourselves and demanding to be known as a sex class. Women and girls exist as a coherent category of people distinct from men and boys. And a lot of people really don't like that. Turf. OK. OK. So what, what does Women's Liberation Front do? Women's Liberation Front does a number of things, including fighting for the abolition of gender. It's currently got a lawsuit before federal district court in the in federal court in California, complaining about a California law that mandates the incarceration of men and boys or men rather in the women's prison. And there are under California law, as far as I know, a couple of hundred men being housed in the women's prison. And Wolf currently has a lawsuit pending challenging that in federal court, arguing that the policy allowing men in women's prisons violates the First Amendment, the Eighth Amendment and various other constitutional provisions. I should say I'm not directly involved in that lawsuit, nor do I currently serve on the board of Women's Liberation Front, although I am a member. Wow. So it sounds like you lead a somewhat stressful life. You know, it was stressful for a period of time, but it just feels so important to be able to have honest conversations about sex and gender that I, I'm sort of used to it by now. Okay. Well, that's good. So you claim in your book uh, that the term transgender was invented to serve a political purpose. Can you walk me through uh, that argument? So my understanding is that in the 1960s and 70s, continuing into the 80s, there was a growing movement within the academy it's coming out of postmodernism, right? So postmodernism is sort of this idea that material reality doesn't exist. And so coming out of postmodernism came queer theory which was the idea that the material reality of biological sex doesn't exist. However, if a bunch of academics had tried to persuade ordinary, average, everyday Americans across the political spectrum 
that the material reality of biological sex doesn't exist, they wouldn't have been able to do it because everybody knows what a man is and what a woman is. And so they, they invented the term. My argument is that they invented the term transgender to make it sound as though there is a coherent category of people who are being deprived of civil rights, but that's Mm -hmm. just not true. Okay. So, um, from what I know, the, the argument that's more in favor of transgenderism for lack of a better description would be that there was a fairly significant subset of people that identified as transgender that were always ignored, that had high suicide rates because they weren't allowed to express themselves properly. Um, What's your opinion on that argument? There's just no evidence that it's true. (laughs) I mean, there's just literally no credible evidence that there's that that's true. There's no support for it whatsoever. You know, we know from studying science and evolution that human beings evolved and that we are mammals. And because we're mammals, all of us, every single one of us is either female or male, like every other mammal on the face of the planet. Okay. So how did we get to where we are now? Because I know I've seen in elementary schools, you know, what they're starting to teach people as early as kindergarten, that gender doesn't exist and that everyone should be, you know, free to express themselves in whatever they way they want to. How did we go from, um, men and women, you know, women's actual women's rights, women deserve rights to where we are now, which is having men on women's swim teams. So a couple things are going on here. One of which is that at the founding of the Republic, uh, the, uh, there's a reason I'm talking about this. The United States constitution did not address women's suffrage instead choosing to leave the matter to the individual states. And at the founding of the Republic, not a single state allowed women to vote because they're women, right? Women were excluded from the vote on the basis of sex. The first state to allow women to vote was not even a state at the time. It was the Wyoming territory. And Mm -hmm. it enacted a law in the late 18th century, I think maybe late 19th century that said it was called something like female franchisement, female enfranchisement. And it said that going forward, women would be allowed to vote. But the reason that that law was necessary is because women had been excluded from the vote on the basis of sex. And now all of a sudden we're being told that sex doesn't exist as a material category, which is very frustrating to women, including feminists who are very interested in fighting for the rights of the category of people called women. So what happened in schools? One of the things you touched on is kids are being taught that they should be able to express themselves in whatever ways that they want. And I think that I would completely agree with that. I think it's very important that kids be able to explore their personalities, their expressions, their preferences regarding hairstyle and clothing and whatever else. And as they get older, sexuality But that doesn't mean that any kids ought to be or even can uh, be encouraged that it's possible to change their sex. In other words, if a boy wants to wear a pink dress, encouraging him to do that is, is great, right? We ought to be encouraging kids to be able to embrace the expressions that they feel best fits with their personality. But the idea that that makes him a girl is, first of all, untrue. Second of all, extremely dangerous to his psychological development. And third of all, grounded in regressive stereotypes that say that girls are like supposed to like pink dresses and boys are like supposed to like blue pants. Right. Feminists have been fighting against these stereotypes forever. And now this ideology is to a great extent grounded in the stereotypes that we wish could be abolished. Yeah, it's confused me a bit. Because it seems to be coming from people who 15 years ago were feminists. And now it feel, I, like you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but it feels like those same people have somehow switched over to, oh, no, now it's transgenderism we're fighting for rather than women. Yeah, I mean, it is confusing. And I would say that what feminists were saying 10 years ago was that kids shouldn't be forced into sex stereotypes, among other things. Feminists have been saying a lot of things for decades, but one of them was that kids shouldn't be forced into sex stereotypes. And I would stand by that statement then and today. But a lot of people seem to have shifted from 
kids shouldn't be forced into sex stereotypes to if a kid likes a sex stereotype that makes the kid the opposite sex. That's a very different thing from what feminists have been saying this whole time. Hmm. So how um, how many people are kind of fighting in the same way you are? Because generally speaking, when you hear the term feminist now, I generally speaking, equate that with people who are very far left, who are fighting for these um, transgender, this transgender movement. When I when I hear feminism, that's what I assume people believe in. So um, you identify as a feminist, but as a true feminist. And is there a group of people that are behind you here? You know, it's, of course, completely understandable that you think that because the mainstream media would have you believe it. All the sort of mainstream large organizations that claim to be feminist organizations like National Association for Women, Planned Parenthood, National Center for Lesbian Rights, all of them are pushing the idea that some men can be women. And they do that by referring to a co to a category of transgender women. But we're talking about men. Um, are there people behind me? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm the president of Women's Declaration International U.S. chapter. We have over 5,000 signatories to the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which is a global document that seeks to enshrine women's sex-based rights in law all over the world. We're global. Uh, the document has over 31,000 signatures globally, again, over 5,000 in the States. And uh, as you mentioned, Women's Liberation Front is also fighting for the sex-based rights of women and girls. So we're out here and, and we do this and we talk about this stuff all the time. One thing that is very frustrating is that we cannot get a voice in most mainstream media outlets. Oh, yeah. They don't even mention us. And when they mention us, they disparage us and say that we're right wing, even though most of us, almost all of us come from a left wing political value system. Um, but we're here. And I don't know if you know where your viewers know. I have never watched Fox News in my life. I was never a fan of Tucker Carlson. I've ended up going on Tucker Carlson, I think like eight or nine times now, because he will platform people like me who will say things like this. And even though I disagree with Tucker Carlson on probably just about everything, I'm grateful for the platform because it's a way to get the word out. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Things are pretty crazy right now. I always identified um, more as a liberal too. I'm pretty much like, let people do, I guess, libertarian, just like let people do what they want to do, express themselves how they want to express themselves, like whatever, as long as you leave me alone, I'm fine. Pretty much. Um, although now with this, um, I have a four-year-old girl and I've been actively concerned about where to put her because I'll go on school websites and you can kind of see on their website what agenda they're pushing. And it shocks me that there aren't more women standing up to this. Like most of even my female friends, because I come from more of a leftist background, most of my female friends are like, oh, it's fine. You know, what's going on is fine. And some of my you know, male friends too, what's going on is fine. And, and then you see things like, you know, if you have one man competing in a women's high school sports team, that diminishes every woman on that team, objectively. It's like just objectively. And I was like, how is this okay with people who are trying to stand up for women? I, I just don't understand how people can be as brainwashed as they are right now. And it's strange to me that somebody like you would have a spot on Tucker Carlson's show and that more left wing media sources aren't picking up on this and agreeing with what you're pushing because I, I it just, it, boggles my mind. Yeah. So you're right that having a man participate in a women's swimming team disadvantages all the women on that team. It also crucially disadvantages the woman who he replaced on that team, right? There's a woman who's not even competing at all. Um, when there's a man on the team, assuming that the team accepts a certain number of athletes. Um, so it's important to understand that this is very well funded and there's a, I, I argue in the book that there's a loosely affiliated conglomeration of businesses, law firms, media outlets, um, corporations 
and academic institutions that are all sort of working together to push this. And there's a lot of money behind it. One really great source of information for this is called the 11th Hour Blog. And the author of that blog goes into an astonishing degree of detail regarding the money that is fueling this. So it is just not the case, which we have been Hmm. told, that transgender is a coherent category of people who are just fighting for their civil rights. It's just not true. It is a very top heavy, very heavily funded, uh, top down movement to abolish sex throughout society. And people have bought it. I don't know why people have bought it. I'm as mystified as you are. Um, But a lot of people haven't. And I hear from people on social media and on email frequently from the political left saying, how did this happen? I'm not going along with this. And so that's really good. Uh, But again, the media won't platform our voices. And so lefties, Democrats, uh, feminists, gay rights activists all over the country feel very isolated because they think they're alone. They, like you, have friends who say, this is fine. We should just go along with this. And people all over the country are thinking, why is this fine? But they think they're alone. And so they're afraid to say something. So how could this possibly be making anybody money? So one example is John Stryker. He is um, he founded something called the Arcus Foundation. He's a very wealthy man. He's a billionaire. And he founded something called the Arcus Foundation, which hands out grants, multimillion dollar grants to fund this. It, it, they, they literally give money to fund this. Yes. And uh, Mr. Stryker is also heir to a medical supply company. So if you sort of connect, yeah, yeah. So you you connected that dot pretty quickly. Oh no. Okay. So can you connect that dot for anybody listening who hasn't connected that dot? What kind of medical supply chain? What did, what is he heavily invested in? So the medical supply industry stands to gain a lot of money and earn a lot of profit by conducting cosmetic surgeries on confused children and young people. Uh, We can't omit pharma. Pharma, of course, makes a ton of profit from putting a generation's worth of children and young people on a lifetime's worth of hormones. That is terrifying, but also completely makes sense. Wow. Okay. Um, What percentage of these, what percentage of trans kids that are put on drugs are women versus or little, you know, girls versus little boys. Yeah, it's interesting. And it seems to be changing every day. For a while, it was thought that the overwhelming majority of people who identify as trans are men uh, claiming to be women, whether they got any hormones or surgery or not. But we're seeing an exponential increase in the number of girls and young women who are going to gender clinics going on testosterone, getting mastectomies that are not medically necessary. Uh, Abigail Schreier has documented all of this in her book, Irreversible Damage. I don't know the stats for the US, but I know that in the UK, in a matter of just a tiny handful of years, I think it's three years, the percentage of young girls and women who went to the NHS gender clinic shot up 4,000%. Oh, that's awful. As if being a teenager isn't confusing enough. A I lot know. Of, yeah, like people experience anxiety. I, like when I was in grade four, for a multitude of reasons, I, I cut off all my hair, which I didn't want to be a little boy. I just cut off my hair and then people were referring to me as a boy because you kind of look the same when you're a little kid. Um, and I was on all the sports teams and I refused to wear dresses. And I like, I was kind of a nerd. So... I would be very concerned for any kid kind of in the same position. That's a tomboy. Like there are lots of little girls that are tomboys. I'm certainly not one anymore, but like I, I was back then and I'd be concerned for any kid in a school that's ideologically that has ideologically possessed teachers that are more tomboyish. Cause then it's like, Oh, well, do you feel, you know, like you're, you identify more with other like little boy or little boys. Are you more comfortable being friends with boys? Maybe, maybe you want to express yourself that way. Maybe that's what you actually truly are. Right. And having that kind of conversation with an adult, you'd be so confused as a kid. 
Yeah. I mean, that's actually already happening. Teachers are telling people, kids as young as four and five, that if they like certain stereotypes, then that actually makes them the opposite sex. I've heard of stories of teachers making gender closets. They literally use the word closet. And when a kid comes to school dressed in whatever the kid's dressed in, teachers will put kids in the closet and have them change clothes without their parents knowing. Teachers will start referring to kids using the kid's chosen name without telling the parents. Kids, uh, teachers will start referring to kids using the kid's preferred pronouns without informing the parents. This is happening today. How, how often though, I had somebody else on my podcast who mentioned this closet thing that's happening. Is that an isolated incident or is this something that's happening in every state in America? I don't know if, well, the closet itself, I don't know how prevalent that is, but the phenomenon of teachers telling kids that they can be the opposite sex, that is rampant. That is absolutely rampant all over the country. <sighs> that's in, that's and, insane. <laughs> you know, and just to your point about how hard it is to be a teenager, it's, it's really hard to be a teenage girl, right? Our bodies change in ways that are just physically uncomfortable, psychologically confusing, and all of a sudden men start treating us differently, right? They start looking at us differently and they start acting differently towards us. And it can be really hard. And it's especially hard for teenage girls who might be feeling same sex attracted. And it's just devastating that today, if teenage girls are starting to explore a same sex attraction, they're being told that they're actually boys because girls aren't allowed to like girls. It's only boys who are allowed to like girls, which is maybe one of the most homophobic things one could think about. Hmm. That's interesting. That, de that definitely makes sense. That definitely makes sense. Um, um, what has the Biden administration done or is trying to do in terms of gender legislation currently? So on the first day of taking office, President Biden signed executive order 13988, preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And in that order, he ordered all federal agencies to look into their policies that relate to sex and to redefine all of their policies so that sex is redefined to include gender identity, which makes sex a meaningless concept in federal administrative law. So over the course of the first six months or so, a little bit more of 2021, the administration, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Departments of Education and Justice have essentially rewritten their policies to completely redefine sex to include gender identity. Um, and they did that essentially without notifying the American people. They dropped this initial um, executive order the first day of taking office and they announced that. But nobody really knows what it means. Yeah. If you're if you're not like deeply involved in this, you don't know what it means to redefine sex to include gender identity. Most people don't un don't, don't understand the implications of that. The implications of that for housing and urban development are that it's impossible to have a female only domestic violence shelter in the U.S. anymore. If a man wants to enter a federally funded domestic violence shelter and the shelter wants to exclude him on the basis that he's male, he can complain that he has a female gender identity and that the shelter is discriminating against him. But when I say that the agencies did this without notifying the American public, that is largely true because they went unnoticed. But what I specifically mean is that there is a law in place that says if a federal agency wants to change its regulations, it has to go through a formal rulemaking process. And it's very complicated, but it really boils down to this. The agency has to notify the public and give the public an opportunity to comment. And that that period is usually something like 60 or 90 days. And then there are specific rules in place that the agency is supposed to read all the comments, publish the comments, answer the comments, et cetera, before changing its law or before changing its rule. And the administration didn't do any of that here. None of it. Do you think people putting these laws in place like Biden or people who are high up, do you think they're being like fooled into this as well? Or do you think they're aware of the ramifications? Like I can see someone saying, oh, no, this is just for the benefit of people to make everyone feel included, but not actually aware of what it's doing. 
Right. I mean, I think two things. One thing I think is that President Biden knows exactly what the word woman means. But I also think that uh, he's gotten a lot of money to do this. You know, that's another thing that these industries are doing is fueling campaigns. The the, the Democratic Party has essentially mm. been bought by an industry whose objective it is to obliterate the material reality of biological sex. The same is true in the UK with labor, right? I, I mean, I don't want to say that the Democrats and labor are identical. There are important differences, but um, but both political parties have been completely bought by an industry that is hell bent on obliterating the material reality of biological sex throughout society. So on the one hand, I, you know, President Biden is not confused about what a woman is, but he's paid to do what he's doing. OK, and do you think the people behind this, you mentioned it kind of drifting up from postmodernism. But do you think the pharmaceutical industry pushing drugs is the main culprit behind this? I think it's a combination. I think it's a combination of postmodernism. And there are other examples in our society where we're sort of pretending like reality isn't real, right? Um, We're at a very dangerous time for any number of reasons. But in this instance, I do think that it's a combination of postmodern denial of the material reality of biological sex and an industry that is fueling that, right? Like they sort of took that and ran with it and they said, oh, great, let's um, let's use it for profit and let's put a generation's worth of kids and young people on a lifetime's worth of hormones. Let's start blocking puberty for all these kids. Let's start giving young people cross sex hormones. They'll be on them for the rest of their lives. That is not an exaggeration. If you start this path, you're on it for the rest of your life. And, and pharma is like, great, we're going to make a bunch of money. Okay. So let's, let's delve into that a little bit. Um, what happens to someone? So, so say you're a, 11 year old girl and you have decided that you identify as a boy and you want to be a man when you grow up, what exactly happens to you? My understanding is that the typical path is that a girl in that situation would go on something called puberty blockers. A puberty blocker was designed for a condition where a kid might enter puberty at an abnormally young age, right? There's a very rare condition where a kid might enter puberty or start puberty at it at the age of eight or nine or something like that. And that's hard, right? Like that's really psychologically yeah. hard for that kid. The kids, you know, the peers aren't there yet and it's just difficult. So, uh, puberty blockers were developed to help that kid delay puberty until it was more developmentally appropriate, but now they're just being given to kids who are starting puberty at an appropriate age, but who don't want to go through their correct sex puberty. And, um, so they'll be on puberty blockers for a couple of years. And then at some point, and it varies by state, but at some point, if a kid wants to go on cross sex hormones, they can do that as well. Meaning a a young woman can go on testosterone. A young man can go on estrogen. And this, this is just, it's horrible. I mean, it's just devastating. It has devastating impacts on these people's bodies. It is known to cause bone density loss. It is known to cause cancer. Uh, a large percentage of people who go on these drugs will die prematurely when they otherwise would not. It is incredibly, incredibly dangerous. And the most recent, one of the recent times I was on Tucker Carlson, he asked me, um, why isn't the medical establishment stopping? Yeah. Yeah. The medical establishment is part of this. These are doctors who are prescribing these dangerous and potentially lethal drugs to children. They must also be brainwashed to a degree, though, because I mean, most doctors become doctors because they want. I'm not a fan of doctors. I had multiple health problems and I was I am not a fan of doctors, but I do know that the doctors that treated me, even though they made mistakes, were trying to help me. So I would assume most of the doctors who are prescribing these, I would hope not that it makes any difference because the end result is still terrible. But I would assume that the doctors who are prescribing these medications are under or uh, believe that they're stopping people from committing suicide or something. Otherwise, why, like, why and how could they do that? Well, I think a lot of them do fit into that category. Exactly. But, but it, I think you're right that it's not most doctors, but here's what's happening. We've got these things called gender clinics, a gender oh, no. clinic. We had like two of them 
uh, something like 10 years ago. And now we've got something like 700 in this country. And so what I think, Mm. what I think doctors do, uh, the ones who think they're doing the right thing, a lot of doctors, a kid will present and say, doctor, I think I'm transgender. And the doctor feels unqualified to handle that kind of thing. And so the doctor thinking that she or he is doing the right thing makes a referral to the experts or the gender clinic. They think that's appropriate. It's like when I was 18, um, I was anorexic and I saw my doctor and my doctor referred me to a eating disorder clinic, right? That's just sort of how things work. Um, and I'm very happy to say that that was effective and I stopped being anorexic. So that's good. But that's, that's what these doctors are doing. They're referring kids to gender clinics, thinking they're doing the right thing. And the people who run the gender clinics, I do not think are motivated by good motives at all. I think these are horrible people who are paid to ruin people's lives. Wow. Okay. Okay. So once a kid starts these, what, what happens if they change their mind? Like I've seen people online where um, they were kind of influenced by their peers and they thought it was the cool thing. And that's what they believed at the time. And then they get to be 21 and, and they're like, okay, that was wrong. I don't want that anymore. What do those people do? So in theory, it's possible to stop uh, after having taken puberty blockers, um, th- the long-term effects of puberty blockers by themselves are not known. So we don't know, for example, if it's ever possible to stop taking puberty blockers and then have a normal puberty. I've heard people say it is possible and I've heard people say it's not possible. Wow. But we, part of the reason we don't know that is that almost no one takes puberty blockers for a few years and then stops. The vast majority of kids that go on puberty blockers go on to take opposite sex hormones. The vast, vast majority go on to take opposite sex hormones. Um, and those are absolutely not reversible. There's no question about that. And yeah, we're seeing a lot, a lot of young people, mostly in their twenties, having gone through all of this and now they, they want to go back, but they're not reversible. So these young people often have to go through sort of psychological torture to realize what they have put themselves through sometimes with the permission of their parents, you know, always with the permission of their doctor and often being encouraged by their therapists. And, um, we have a lot of young women these days with a lot of artificially lowered voices because they can't get their voices back once they've been on testosterone. A lot of women have had double mastectomies and will never have their natural breasts back. Um, and people sort of brush that off and say, well, they can just get synthetic ones. And it's like, how are we here? How on earth are we here? Um, and it's, there are plenty of boys and young men who are going through this as well. It's just much more prevalent in young women because it's young women who are being pressured into this more than boys. And that's not to say I lack sympathy for the boys who are going through this. Of course, I have tremendous sympathy for boys. You know, how, how graphic do you, can, can we be here? No, be graphic. People should know what's going on. Like this is awful. I mean, there are young men who have had their testicles and penises removed. And, um, you know, to go through regret for having done something like that, I I don't know, I'm not a guy, but it just, I just so feel for these young people who were pushed into something as dangerous as, and and these kids are being sterilized. I mean, we can't forget that we're having young people make the decision to be, to sterilize themselves, um, kids who can't buy alcohol are making the decision to sterilize themselves. And I think it's outrageous. So I really feel for these young people who are realizing what happened to them and they're trying to get their lives back. That is crazy. It's insane that you can convince a society to think in a certain way to this degree. It's terrifying. It is. I mean, there are a lot of people who are starting to explore uh, you know, patterns of cult-like behavior. We're starting to look at whether, Mm. um, people who engage in this are engaged in cult-like behavior. I've heard the phrase mass psychosis, um, that, that this is a societal mass psychosis that's going on. We're all sort of gripped by this. Yeah. Well, that's what it looks like. Can you describe, um, the, the Bostock case? So, um, 
what eventually became the Bostock. I say Bostock. I don't know which is right. I don't know if it's Bostock. I'm or Bostock. probably wrong. You're I probably I, right here. I honestly don't know. But um, so so Bostock, I forget his first name. He was a gay man who was fired for being gay. I think that that was not contested. That was agreed. And there was another man named Zarda and he was fired for being gay, uncontested. So these two guys who were fired for being gay sued their employers and said, you can't fire me for being gay. And their cases made their way through the courts. There was another case called Stevens and Stevens is a man, was a man who demanded to be referred to as a woman for employment purposes. And his employer said, well, we're not going to do that. And so Amy Stevens sued his employer and Stevens case made its way through the court system. So all three cases eventually reached the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided to take them. And then what it did is it smushed them all together. Basically, the legal term I shouldn't say smush. The, the court joined the cases, um, which meant that the cases were going to be heard together and decided on together. And so it ended up being called Bostock, but it's actually three cases, two gay men and one man who identifies as a woman. And the court eventually ruled that under Title VII, which is our employment discrimination law, anti-discrimination law, employers cannot discriminate against people on the basis of either sexual orientation or transgender status. And it puts that phrase in quotes and it never defines what transgender status is. It just assumes that transgender status is a thing without telling us what it means. This episode was sponsored by BioOptimizers. The folks at BioOptimizers have done it again. They've just released their new formula for magnesium breakthrough, the most potent magnesium supplement on the market. If you struggle with anxiety, have trouble sleeping, depression, or are just overworked and stressed, Try magnesium even before you try meditation. And honestly, go low carb if you're suffering. Might as well get rid of the food you love too, right? I'm kidding. It works though, it's worth it. But something to add on to that or do anyway, magnesium supplementation. About 50% of Americans are magnesium deficient, which means you really might be, which is crazy because it helps with all sorts of things from diabetes, muscle relaxation and blood pressure to metabolism and digestion. There's a reason it's called our body's master mineral. The problem is most supplements are synthetic or only have a couple of types of magnesium. Magnesium Breakthrough by BioOptimizers has all seven organic forms plus cofactors to increase absorption, ensuring stress relief and high cognitive performance. Many of their customers immediately notice the effects. Be in charge of your well-being. Take one before bed every night and see how you feel in the morning. BioOptimizers even has an exclusive offer to get you started. Visit magbreakthrough.com slash Peterson or use code Peterson at checkout for 10% off. It's also a great gift. Magbreakthrough.com slash Peterson. Uh, next question. What What is Table 42 of the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting Program? So that is the FBI's way of recording and reporting crime statistics by sex. The last data that I have seen reports 2020. The last I've seen is 2020. And it reports um, crime statistics by sex. And it shows, unsurprisingly, which it has shown for the past several decades since it's been doing the program, I think it started in the 1930s, that men overwhelmingly commit most violent and sex crimes. It's usually mm -hmm. something like men commit about 87% of murders and somewhere around there for aggravated assaults. Men commit something like 95 to 98% of rapes. And we can only know that because the FBI records it that way based on data that it gets from local law enforcement agencies. And I'm following. We should see. Let's see. We're in May of 2022. We should see 2021 data pretty soon. And I'm following it because I want to see how is the FBI going to report crime statistics? We've already. In, in other words, we cannot talk about male violence against women if we cannot talk about who are the male people and who are the female people. Under Biden's executive order, presumably the FBI should have to obliterate that reporting system because now gender identity is all that matters. But it hasn't done so yet, to the best of my knowledge. And um, 
you know, we'll see what it does for 2021. I know what I wanted to say. There was a group of attorney generals, state attorney generals that submitted a letter to Christopher Ray, the head of the FBI, and and said, we want you to start recording a category called non-binary. We want you to record mm-hmm. male crime, female crime and non-binary crime. And I don't think the FBI has done it yet, but they've been asked to. OK, well, give it another five or 10 years, two years, maybe. Well, <laughs> given the direction we're heading in. OK, let's see. What do I, else do I have here? That we should definitely talk about. Um, let's do. OK, this is probably good just for everybody to know what what is the Equality Act? The Equality Act was first introduced in 2015, and it was reintroduced last year. And what it would do is redefine the word sex to include the words gender identity, among others, for purposes of all United States civil rights law. So this would mean Hmm. that for, for purposes of United States civil rights law, the category of women and girls would cease to have any meaning, including public accommodations law. So this is one of what I think is one of the most outrageous aspects of this whole thing. We have in our civil rights law, a public accommodations law, and it's from 1964. And it says public accommodations, which means businesses, right? It means like bars, restaurants, movies, the whole thing. You're not allowed to discriminate on the basis of race. Great, right? Crowning victory of the U.S. civil rights movement after decades of legal racial segregation, which was horrible, uh, the civil rights movement fought back and said, you know, black people have just as much right to use the bathroom in this restaurant or in this hotel as white people. There came to be a case called Heart of Atlanta Motel, which was explicitly white only. I mean, that was their policy. They had a white only policy and a black family sued and said, you can't do that. And the Supreme Court eventually said, you're right. They can't do that. So no more racial segregation in places of public accommodation. Good major victory for civil rights. Mm -hmm. Now, what the Equality Act would do is redefine all the words. Um, So so the Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of several categories. And what this would do is add sex, including gender identity to our public accommodations law, which would mean that every hotel, every restaurant, every stadium, every arena, every place of public accommodation would be prohibited from discriminating against men in the bathroom if the men had a female gender identity. All over the country. This is so wild. <laughs> this is so, it's so wild. It's so 1982. Okay, next question. Still have a whole bunch of these to, go, to, get, to get through. Uh, who's Dana Rivers? Dana Rivers. Let me just go back for one second and say the Equality Act passed in the House of Representatives in, I think, February of 2021. And it passed in the Senate Judiciary Committee in March of 2021. However, starting in March of 2021, the majority leader of the Senate, Charles Schumer, has had the authority to bring it to a vote in the United States Senate. And he has not done so. That's over a year. He has Hmm. had the ability to pass this thing and he hasn't done it. And I think it's because he doesn't have the votes for it, because I think that notwithstanding what people say in public, I think our politicians are starting to listen to us, which I think is a good thing. I I hope I hope you're right. Um, Before we get into Dana Rivers, um, let me think. If this kind of thing passes, so say you're talking to someone and, th- and they just say, no, this is, it's too, it's too graphic. What you're saying just isn't true. If this kind of, uh, if these kind of laws come into play, what kind of changes could we potentially see on a societal level? Well, I mean, so my city, DC has a very similar law already on the books. And, um, I've walked into a bathroom in a, a women's room in a restaurant and there was a guy in there and he was wearing a long dress and pink nail polish and long blonde hair and a lot of makeup. And it was terrifying. So we're just going to see a lot more of that. Yeah, that is terrifying. I don't know. Like, I don't think people talk about that either is it's scary. If you see like you, you're not allowed to to talk about that for some reason, but if you see a man dressed up as a woman and it's like, looks like a man 
and they're like close to you, it's scary. It's objectively scary because it's also like, I don't know how stable this person is. They're a lot bigger than me. Um, I'm not allowed to say anything about it or act like something's off. Uh, it's scary. Right. And I think that is a reasonable reaction to that kind of thing. Yeah, but I do. I, I want people to to stop thinking they're not allowed to say anything. I understand why people do think we're not allowed to say anything. There's a tremendous amount of social pressure to go along with this and to not be mean and to be nice to the man in the pink dress. I know I get it. But, you know, I I really think that even though it is Republicans in the political arena who are standing up against this, Americans across the political spectrum could kill this if we would get together and start talking about it. I really think we could. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, that's the purpose of this podcast. I think I'm going to do a few more on this topic because, um, you know, five, maybe five or six years ago, I thought, you know, I think my dad mostly started talking about this and I was like, he sounds kind of paranoid. It sounds like he's a little bit paranoid about this topic. And, and then now you see what's happening now with like, I keep using the example of women's swim team, but that, w- that just made me so angry. I was like, how could you do that to the people on the swim team? And how can everyone stand there and think and, and pretend it's okay? Like, well, that, po- that points to something else that I just want to highlight, which is there's no amount of capitulating that will please these people. And by these people, I mean the industry that is fighting to abolish sex. And here's why I'm saying that now, you know, I think that I I think I, I, I think that what your dad said was basically, I will use people's preferred pronouns. I just don't want to be compelled to use them. That's that's completely. Yeah. I mean, that's a completely reasonable thing to, to, to say, I mean, I won't use people's preferred pronouns, but if your dad wants to use them, okay. (laughs) You know, but, um, he just said he didn't want to be forced to, or compelled to, Yeah, not, not good enough, not good enough for today's gender identity movement. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Okay. Um, what do you think the impact of the Trump presidency was on women's rights? Well, I mean, now we're shifting gears a little bit, but obviously one of the biggest impacts of that presidency, whose name I don't say, um, was the Supreme Court and, you know, the three justices that are now poised to overturn Roe v. Wade. And, you know, I will say the prior administration was obviously not as horrific on the topic of gender identity as the current administration, but it wasn't great either. I mean, it did a couple things that I was glad to see it do, but it could have done a lot more and I wish it had. Hmm. Okay. So how do you think we avoid, like, what do we do going forward? How do we try and uh, change the direction that things are heading in? We just start talking about it. We absolutely have to start talking about it. So again, thank you so much for having me on. I know that people feel under a tremendous amount of social pressure to go along with it and to not fight back, but that has consequences. And so, you know, I don't want anyone to lose their employment, but if your employer tells you that you have to start putting your preferred pronouns in your email signature, please resist if you can. And I should say, it's maybe not obvious to everyone why preferred pronouns are related to all of this. But if you delve into this topic uh, in any depth, it's very clear that the whole concept of preferred pronouns is not just some kind of courtesy. It's not just some kind of new fad that we're doing. It's a very deliberate strategy to make people forget that we can very obviously see what sex each other is. Like I can clearly see that you are a woman. I do not need you to have she, her in your zoom screen. Right. I mean, yeah, but the preferred pronouns are much more pernicious than they seem to be. Um, so please resist if you can and, and talk to each other, you know, talk to, talk to people, especially parents like yourself, right? Like parents across the political mm-hmm. spectrum do not want their children to be told that anyone can be a boy or a girl on their say. So, um, I think parents have a huge amount of power here to help push back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's, that's good advice. Just say what you believe. And I I think people could also say what they believe under the assumption that other people also believe that because you get into a situation sometimes where there's one person in the room who's loud and everyone else is thinking the same thing and not saying anything. So this is a classic case of emperor's new clothes, 
right? In the fable, the emperor's new clothes, nobody would acknowledge that the emperor was naked. And the reason that they wouldn't acknowledge that the emperor was naked was because nobody else was acknowledging that the emperor was naked. So they didn't want to be stupid or they didn't want to seem stupid. And then one time, you know, once the little kid said, the emperor's not wearing any clothes, everybody felt free to say it. That's exactly what's going on here. Wild. Wild. But I also do want to say in terms of what can we do, um, Elected officials at all levels of government are are dealing with this local, state and federal. And every single American has an ability, if not a responsibility, to contact your local officials and tell them what you think. I don't care about political party. I don't care if you're a Republican and you're represented by a Democrat or vice versa or the same. You know, a lot of people think it's useless to fight the Democrats on this. And I understand why um, they're they're showing us what they think. But um It's not useless because if you tell them what you think, then they can never say that they didn't know. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't change course, they can never say that they didn't know. And so we can all push back on this with our elected officials. And there are things that Republicans have to hear, too. As I said, Republicans are the only political party pushing back on this at all. And I'm glad that they are. But I don't know if a lot of Republicans really understand the urgency. I was meeting with... um, staffer for a Republican senator. And he sort of listened politely and then said, well, you know, I hope you know that my boss agrees with you. And I was like, well, that's nice. But is your boss going to do anything? Like how many kids have to be mutilated before your boss takes action? And that was on the Republican side. So Republicans have to hear from us, too. Yeah, that's a good point. It's so strong in the other direction right now that it's just a sticky territory to to wade into. So I suppose as a politician, you wouldn't want to take a firm stand against it. Otherwise, you'd be the politician taking a firm stand against it. And then you'd be the transphobic politician. And then who knows if you're going to get elected, right? That's how strong it's going in one direction. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, there are Republicans in Congress who have introduced some good bills. Tom Cotton has a really good bill in the Senate. And there's another, um, sorry, Mike Lee has a really good bill in the Senate to protect Mm. women's sports. I believe the cotton bill would make sure that state prisons are segregated by sex. And that's a good thing. So there are things that are happening, which is great. And Republicans are taking a stand, some. Um, But I also just want everyone to know that there was a bill passed in the state of South Carolina recently to protect women's sports at all levels from elementary school through college in South Carolina. And by my count, 14 state Senate Democrats, no, sorry, 14 House Democrats and six Senate Democrats voted for this bill. So things are changing. There are Democrats, at least at the state level, who are willing to take a stand. And that's a good thing. Okay. before we wrap it up, can you tell me a bit about Dana Rivers? So Dana Rivers was born David Warfield and he lives in California And in November of 2016, I should say for several years, uh, he was very active in an effort to shut down Mitch Fest, which was a woman only music festival, uh, mostly lesbians, but woman only music festival in Michigan. And he worked very hard to get that shut down. And in November 2016, there was a lesbian couple in Oakland who had a teenage son And they had been very active in Mitch Fest for several years. And the police received a call of a shooting and they arrived at the home of this lesbian couple and their teenage son. And Dana Rivers, who by that point was claiming to be a woman, uh, was standing in the lawn uh, covered in blood and I believe holding a gun and several knives. And the teenage boy was lying on the ground in front of him. And the two women inside had been brutally murdered. And he has been charged with several counts of aggravated murder. And uh, that case has been pending since 2016. So he has not been convicted. He is being housed in the Santa Rita jail in California and classified as female. Oof. Yeah. And the trial has been scheduled numerous times and rescheduled. His plea is insanity. And the last I checked... The court had sort of continued the case several times, waiting for the doctor's report to assess the insanity plea. 
but this has been going on for years. And I honestly, I am not entirely sure what is going on with the case and I can't find out. Currently, the trial is scheduled for this July, but that could change. Brutal. Okay. Okay, Kara, um, if people want to follow you online or want to keep up with this and what you're doing, where should they go? So you can go to www.karadansky.com or www.womensdeclarationusa.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Kdansky. I'm also on Facebook using my name, Kara Dansky. And please buy my book. It's on Amazon, Abolition of Sex, How the Transgender Agenda Harms Women and Girls. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. We're going to link everything in show notes if anyone's interested in the book. But and oh, and the book is available. The book is available on Audible just as of the other day. Oh, good. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, hopefully this podcast encourages people to start talking about this and that other people are thinking what they're thinking, that this is crazy. So thank you very much for coming on and what you're doing. Perfect. Thanks for having me.